city governance reform. And uh, congratulations, everyone who came to join us on uh, participating in the very first remote uh, meeting, uh, I shouldn't say remote, the very first meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee outside of City Hall. Um, just by way of background, we created this committee for the purpose of reviewing uh, some of the fundamental governance reform needs that Los Angeles has uh, with an eye towards putting some of those changes on the ballot so that all of you can vote on them in the 2024 election. And f for myself, I won't speak for other members, but one of the top priorities uh, for that is fundamentally changing the way we redraw, redraw our districts uh, during the decennial census when we have to redraw lines. Um, you all saw uh, that that process was badly broken this time, uh, this last time. And um, we uh, may, actually, Council Member Rahman and, and I introduced a motion long ago uh, to try to create a new system that would be entirely independent of the city council uh, so that citizens would draw the lines uh, and the city council would have no role in it whatsoever. And uh, unfortunately, that motion uh, never did see the light of day. And so this committee was formed uh, after I became council president so that we could consider that and many other ways to make your city government more effective um, and uh, more accountable, uh, more transparent, and ultimately more trustworthy. And, and so that is uh, the reason that we're here today. So as we've been considering uh, redistricting, one of the central issues that comes up in that discussion is um, whether or not it still makes sense to have 15 council districts. We have had 15 council districts in Los Angeles for 100 years, uh, since a time when the population of Los Angeles was a million people. And now that we're 4 million people, all of a sudden those districts seem um, much more crowded there's a lot more people in, in each one of our council districts, which means um, that the, uh, the responsiveness of council members uh, is a little bit more distant from the people when you have a, a much larger population in each district. The other impact that it has is it's, uh, I, I use the analogy of a game of musical chairs. Uh, if you have fewer chairs, there's fewer opportunities for as many people as possible to sit in those chairs. Uh, if we really want to have a city council that represents the full diversity of Los Angeles, where everybody has an opportunity to elect somebody to the council who uh, reflects their views and their backgrounds and their communities, then um, in my view, it, it, it may be helpful to uh, increase the number of seats and make them smaller uh, so that people have more responsiveness. But that's the topic for today's discussion. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, we're taking these hearings out on the road so that we maximize the public's opportunity to be able to engage in this dialogue. So tonight, you'll be hearing uh, a detailed um, set of recommendations and considerations from uh, the chief legislative analyst. Uh, who is our policy staff expert in this area. Um, and it'll be a detailed presentation that you'll hear. And you'll all have an opportunity to weigh in, not just on that issue, but any other issue that you want to talk about with regard to redistricting reform or other charter reform uh, considerations. So um, if you would like to do that, if you would like to provide comment, there are cards that look like this that are on the back table. Um, if you could just fill, fill them out and put them in that brown box right there on the front table, um, we'll take uh, as many of them as, as we can uh, throughout the course of the evening. And I think what we'll do, I think what we'll do, uh, members, if, unless somebody feels strongly otherwise, maybe what we'll do is start with comments before we go to the presentation. Um, it, it, does anybody, would, would you rather hear the presentation first? Yes. Okay, so be it. Uh, I, I only do that just so you didn't have to wait so long if you didn't want to, but um, I, we'll go ahead and 
hear the presentation and we'll reserve, we'll, we'll make sure that we're done with the presentation no later than say six, so that we'll have time uh, to receive the public comments as well. Um, We'll play, we'll play that by ear as we go. Um, I just wanted to let you know, this is the first hearing that we're having outside of City Hall, but it won't be the last. Uh, we'll be going on May 22nd to Van Nuys City Hall, and we'll, at that time we'll receive a briefing on how a an independent redistricting commission might be selected. Um, on June 1st, we'll be meeting at the Cheviot Hills Recreation Center uh, on uh, instructions that uh, the commission will be given for how to draw maps, what sort of considerations need to go into that, and then we'll come back to City Hall on June 12th at 10 a.m. and we'll be briefed on uh, how we set up a, an appropriate support system for the Independent Redistricting Commission. And then after we hear all of that input from the CLA, from the public, uh, this committee will debate all of the many nuanced issues that there are in this uh, and we will come up with a proposal that we'll recommend to the council and that the council will hopefully uh, be prepared to put on the ballot so that you'll have an opportunity to to say yes or no to that so that's the process and um, with that uh, do any other members want to say any, any any introductory comments before we begin with the presentation I think just um, the only thing I would say is, so uh, I, I just want to say for those of you who are joining this independent redistricting discussion for the first time, I did want to say that this piece of it, the size of the council is only one piece of it. And we've had discussions already about the broader overview of what an independent redistricting process might look like and we'll have other pieces of it being discussed in the future. That doesn't mean you need to limit your comments today to just the size of the council. We welcome comments on all of it, but today the presentation will be just about the size of the council, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing that's being considered. The broader question is really around how do we make the shape of council districts into a process that isn't determined through political gain or your own political fortunes, but really around what's reflects the needs of the city. That's the broader question at hand here and what you're welcome to weigh in on today. And I'm really grateful that so many of you came to give your input. Thank you, very good point. Uh, before we begin, um, I know, I'll, I'll come back to that. I know, I forgot. <laughs> um, I do want to take just a moment to thank uh, Dave Johnson and the entire team here at the Expo Center for opening up their home to us. This is a great venue, and we really appreciate all of the hard work that goes into putting together a meeting like this. So uh, thank you to them and uh, to my staff and our respective staffs and the CLA and the clerk uh, for, um, for making today possible. Uh, also, there will be a recording of this meeting that will be uploaded to the city clerk's YouTube page after the meeting has concluded. So um, there will be another opportunity to review what you've heard and for other people to, to hear that as well. Um, with that, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Here. Here. Present. Present. Here. 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 Seven members present and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. So I would like to first, uh, or I'd like to now invite up uh, Steve Liu, uh, who will be leading today's presentation. He is an analyst with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. And um, Mr. Liu, the floor is yours. And Mr. Chair, if I may, I just flag if anyone requires Spanish language interpretation, our interpreter is seated right up here in the front row, and there are headsets available. Thank you. Um, can the interpreter just repeat that in Spanish, please? Thank you. Mr. Liu, the floor is yours. Another one? Another one. 
Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair, John Wickham with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst as well. Um, I just want to just very quick introduction here. Please. Um, because we do have a lot more people here who may not be familiar with the work that you've been doing, so maybe a, 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 just a quick overview would be helpful. Um, we have produced a, a, a large report that covers this um, topic of independent redistricting substantially. It's on the council file, and I'm not quite sure how, you know, hopefully the public knows how to reach the council file, but the clerk might be able to help in um, providing information on, on how, to, how people can find that report. Um, the, the main topics that we're covering in the question of independent redistricting are on the chart here, which is the number of council districts, which is the topic you have today. And in other meetings, we're talking about issues such as what is the purpose of independent redistricting, how the commission will be organized, how many members would be on the commission, um, the qualifications and responsibilities of being a commissioner, um, the selection process for um, how, how, the, how people will be selected to become a commissioner, the requirements for redistricting when the commissioners are drawing their maps, how public meetings will be um, held and how many there will be and um, processes for that. And then um, just uh, functional things such as records and data to make sure that the commissioners have good information when they're making their decisions, that their decisions are made in a public forum, and that all of that is available for the public to view and consider and comment on throughout the entire process. And then we want to make sure that the commission is set up with proper funding and staffing and in other administrative matters so they can do their work effectively for for the people of the city. And so these are this is the whole scope of issues plus others that will that are on the table and ready for discussion. And um, you've um, set up the committee has set up a process of several months to make sure that the public has plenty of opportunity to participate in the discussion going forward. And you are not, you're not taking votes today, you're not taking votes next month or the month after until you receive the input um, from the public, from academics, from um, the, the advocates for this issue so that you have the full scope of decisions, uh, information available before you prepare something that will finally go before the voters because this question must go to the voters um, in order to um, implement the changes that are will be developed as a result of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Wickham. And that's a very good point that bears repeating. I just want to make sure everybody um, understands. We will not be voting on anything today because this is part of a long process of input. And that input includes not only these public hearings, but also the participation in reports of people like the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, um, all of the uh, leading academic experts in, in the Southern California area who um, uh, are preparing an independent report about how best to do independent redistricting. We're taking all of that in before we will take any votes on what the actual policy should be. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, one last thing as Steve keys up his slides is that as you remember from your last meeting, um, public testimony came at, at, the, at the beginning rather than um, later in the presentation. So we had set up our presentation so that there was um, some presentation questions from the, from, the, from the committee members, presentation questions from the committee members. So stop us if you want to do the, if you want to do the questions or if you want us to just go through the presentation, we can, you know, Steve can do that, then the public can comment and then we can come back to the questions. However, so. I, I think we'll we'll let that develop organically, although I, I imagine that members will have questions as we go, and rather than losing the train of thought, we'll, we'll ask questions. We won't be taking any actions, obviously. Um, and then we'll, we'll, as soon as you wrap up, we'll take the public comment. Sounds good. So okay. I'll turn it over to Steve now. Great, thanks for the introduction, John. Um, good afternoon, council members. Thank you so much for having me here today to provide a presentation for you regarding um, council expansion. Uh, as mentioned earlier, my name is Steve Liu with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. And for today's discussion, I'll, presenting, I'll be presenting on several aspects of our report that talk about various proposals for expanding the size of the council, as well as some other con additional considerations that um, the council and the committee should consider when we're putting forward a ballot measure, should, should we put forward a ballot measure to expand the council. 
Um, in order to help us frame today's conversation, I would like to start off by discussing the city's past efforts as it relates to increasing the size of the council. Prior to 1924, the city council consisted of nine members who were elected on an at-large basis to represent the city. During this time, the city went through a period of growth, both in terms of population and in the diversity of the city, as the demographic and social landscape continued to change in the last century. Due to this, as part of the 1924 charter reform effort, two competing measures were presented to the voters to increase the size of the council. One where the council would increase to 11 members who were elected at large, and another that would increase the council to 11 members elected via a district-based system. Both of these measures both these measures passed, and due to their conflicting nature, they had to be presented to the California Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of the district-based elections with 15 districts. Following this effort, during the 1999 charter reform movement, two separate measures were again introduced to expand the size of the council. One measure that was proposed to increase the council to two specific numbers. One was 21 members, and the other was 25, me me member 25 members. Both measures failed by um, large, large margins. Now that we've given a historical context, I would like to move on to the next slide to give a snapshot that shows a comparison of Los Angeles's council size relative to the councils of other major US cities. As can be seen on the second column, Los Angeles has the largest share of representation for residents per elected official at a ratio of one council member to approximately 265,000 residents. New York City, on the other hand, has a share of one member to 172,631 residents, and Chicago has a share of one member to 54,944 residents. In the example of New York, their population is not only twice as large as Los Angeles, but their council is also over three times as large with 51 members. Chicago, on the other hand, has less of a population relative to Los Angeles, but a council that is over three times as large as Los Angeles. Uh, in addition to New York and Chicago, on this slide, I also included the, the cities of Houston, Phoenix, and Philadelphia, who have both um, district-based elections similar to our system, as well as uh, district-based and a combination with at-large elections as well. So moving on to the next slide, we're going to be talking about proposals as it relates to um, expanding the size of the council. So for the, for, the first, for the first proposal that we're going to be talking about, this is going to be based on a population growth methodology. This methodology adjusts the size of the council via population growth and ties the number of council districts to, to a set population variable. This would allow for proportional increases to the size of the council relative to the city's population growth. For the purposes of this methodology, we analyzed three separate population variables for, um, uh, anal for, for our analysis. Uh, the three population variables that we studied were 150,000 residents, 200,000 residents, and 250,000 residents. As part of this slide, I included a figure from our report, and this figure shows a comparison of historical population over the last several decades dating back to 1990. Uh, and this, all, this slide also shows the historical population comparison relative to the population variables as mentioned earlier. As we can see from this figure, the lower the population variable, the greater the degree of variance that, we get, that will be between the amount of council districts within the city. As the city's population grew, with the 150,000 150, resident population variable, we can see that the um, council districts within the city would have been much larger in 1990 at 23 council districts and would grow up to 29 council districts by 2030, which is a population estimate that was provided by um, the Southern California Association of Governments. Similarly, as we go on to the next population variable of 200,000, um, the population would, would have historically grown by approximately two seats for three decades and would eventually grow up to um, 21 council members by 2030. The most similar comparison that we can have to today's system would be the 250,000 uh, resident population variable, which is very close to our current ratio of council members of one council member to 265,000 residents. As we can see, over the last several decades, if we use this population variable, we would have maintained the current structure of the 15-member council up until 2030 if the population reached approximately 4.3 million residents. 
As part of the consideration of this methodology, uh, the committee should also know that an important factor that should be considered would be both would be a rounding methodology that is combined with ensuring that we have that ensuring that we could possibly have an odd number of council districts. Um, the committee consider for the purposes of this analysis, our report considered a math considered using mathematical rules for rounding, but the committee can also consider any other method that they so choose. As I said earlier, this example ensures that rounding is tied to an odd number of council districts for each for each um, population variable as the population of the city continues to grow. Okay. The next couple slides after this one are going to be um, from the decision matrix that we've had uh, from our report as it relates to a fixed population methodology. Um, I can go through each of the decision points, or if the committee members would like to um, take a brief break to have a discussion on this. Keep going. Okay. So um, with this decision, matrix, this decision matrix, um, we have the decision point of choosing a population variable. As I mentioned earlier, we go through 150,000, 200,000, or 250,000 residents per district or we could choose some other ratio methodology that the um, committee sees fit. This next one talks about the rounding methodology, which we you can either round to the nearest odd whole number, or we can go, we, we can use a different methodology that the committee develops. As part of um, our analysis related to our population methodology with growth, we found that there needed to be certain additional considerations that could help uh, the technical considerations that could help move this along and also prevent any potential headaches in the future. Um, one of the first ones is that in line with the concept of an independent redistricting commission, we um, would like, we, we, we realize that when the U.S. Census data, when the U.S. Census Bureau releases the data that they have, that it may be best to establish the number of council districts via a certification process from a city department. Um, this would allow for an independent certification that is transparent and would be um, certified follow 30 days following uh, the release of the U.S. Census Bureau data. Um, as part of our report, we looked at potentially the several departments in the city that could certify this data. It could either be the city clerk's office, it could be the Bureau of Engineering, it could be the planning department, or um, it could be the city's data bureau, which will be discussed later on in a future meeting. The next consideration that we had was um, when we established these council districts, we felt that we needed to have some clarity as it relates to when these council districts would actually be in a place for an, a future election. So for the options that we have here, we looked at whether or not we wanted um, the districts to be in place in a year ending in one, which is when uh, the U.S. Census Bureau data gets released and the redistricting commission gets, uh, uh, undertakes their work and adopts the recommendations. So as a result of that, elect, an election, this, these new districts would apply for elections following 2032 and thereafter. The next option would be for a year ending in two, whereby election, these new district boundary lines would apply for a special election in 2033 and any election thereafter and elections in 2030, uh, with a, for a year following a uh, year ending in three, which would be elections for 2034 and thereafter. The next consideration that we had was also looking at whether or not um, we should establish minimum maximum limits for the amount of council districts that would be established uh, following uh, using this fixed population methodology uh, uh, variables. Mainly, this consideration is important because we realize that large shifts in the city's population can dramatically change the size of the council, and establishing limits provides constraints if there are unpredictable swings in the city's population. For Mr. Mr. if you could hang on one second, Mr. Blumenfield oh, had a question. Just a follow-up question. You said that in, if it's on the two in the year twenty or the, the the year three, you would apply the special. But how could you do that if all the other districts? Uh, are under the old system, how do you apply a special election to a district that that would overlap with other districts and that would um, potentially leave parts of the city unrepresented? Or even, or even a regular election, since we have staggered 
uh, seats. I, mean, I just think you'd have to do it all on a, re on a regular election cycle. Well, yeah, even in a regular election, you're going to have to alter everyone at some point. Yeah, we, um, there are some questions that the city attorney had in this area with regard to special elections and what the boundaries are that we were not able to resolve. Um, and so I think there's some more discussion that we need to have with the city attorney on this, this factor. I think ideally um, you would want them to go into effect either in, uh, for elections in 32 or 34. Um, those are your regular election schedule. But you, you do have options. And so we were, we were pointing out the options that might be available to you. When you get to the point of actually determining um, that point, we can, we can discuss that in a little bit more depth. But I, it, it is unlikely that um, effective for elections in a special election in 33 and later would be ideal. Okay. So. And then, and then when, similarly, when do the folks in office start representing the new district versus the old district? If once it, it would be the 30, well, if, it, if you, if, if this is exactly what we just did for 22, right? So we have two members on the committee currently who are representing the new boundaries that were included in the election for the redistricting that just happened, right? So um, that happens is that when, when the boundaries are adopted, the new districts go in place. And there's this, this odd transition period that the city attorney has been looking at and trying to deal with. And there are questions for special elections or other situations where you're trying to figure out what boundaries you're using in, in that special circumstance. And there's, it's, it's not fully clear. And, and you know, for another model, the, the, the state Senate doesn't do, doesn't do that. They have this odd thing where they you keep representing the district that you were in and then they make sure that that is represented by someone else. I, I like our model better, but if we're looking at all the models, we should look at the state Senate model too for how yeah. that, that works. Y yes, I mean, and I mean, the other, the, uh, there's another model. I don't think we want to go into that. Um, but um, yeah, so there, there are d certainly different ways to, to go about doing that. And the question is um, creating, I think, stability for voters and understanding who's representing them is really the ultimate objective. So thank you. Council Member Hernandez. Thank you, Council President. Um, my question is around the, maxim the minimum and maximum limits. Uh, what are the benefits of having that? And have any other jurisdiction actually set those limits and have had to use them? So as it relates to the minimum and maximum limits for um, city council districts, the benefits of having the limits are that um, they, are, they kind of act as a stopgap for any potential large shifts that can lead to logistical, administrative, and operational diff difficulties, um, not just for city staff, but for future candidates that might run in the future. Um, and as it relates to um, any other jurisdictions that have had that, whether or not they've established minimum and maximum limits in our, our research, we did not find that. Yeah, the population growth. And also in addition to that, um, there's no other jurisdiction that looks at this population growth methodology that um, we're talking about as it relates to uh, with the minimum and maximum limits and just with all the population variables as well. Wonderful, thank you. I'd like for us to just keep our eyes on that because it does feel like we would be tying the hands of future governments to a set limit. I mean, I think the flexibility would be good to have a range, but um, I'm nervous about setting that up for future folks. Councilmember Ahmed. Thank you. Thank so you. just, thank you. So just so I understand what you're talking about here is that when population changes in the jurisdiction that the number of council districts automatically changes in every redistricting cycle based on criteria that we would establish and that potentially you could put a minimum and a maximum number of council districts um, as part of the criteria that would govern the changes. Is that right? So that's, what, that's option one that you're laying out. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, just, just to briefly speak to that. We shouldn't take that as a foregone conclusion by any means, and, and hopefully you'll discuss the pros and cons, because uh, at least my gut reaction is changing, the, changing it every time the population changes is extremely disruptive. 
because there is a stability in the geography of when you create these districts, regardless of a lot of variance. You know, it's one thing every several decades when we explore changing it through a process like this, it's another thing the population changes and then you've got to redo the horseshoe, redo the offices, redo a lot of things that um, <coughs> at least my initial thinking is that doesn't make sense. But uh, I'm obviously open to hearing all of this, but and hopefully as part of this discussion, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of it because I see both in terms of varying it. And, and it may be that's why there are no jurisdictions that use this model to change their number of council districts. And the, the Congress used this for the first, what, 100, 150 years of the history of the nation, and Congress stopped it. it the current number is what, 435? 435. What was the last time that changed? Any idea? You um, know, Mr. Vulich? We have that in our report. I, it's and it's, it's been as long as I can remember. So. It was, yeah, I think it was either the 1880s or the, yeah, or the, right. So we'll track that down. So well, I can't remember that far, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, any other questions? Councilmember Park. Thank you. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on uh, Charter Section 204E and how, what the impacts would be if that charter section would, was removed. Could a newly elected council member have their term termed? <laughs> this, this, so this particular charter section currently states that no existing council, sitting council member can lose their their seat as a result of redistricting. Um, this question has broken our brains on multiple occasions as we've tried to play out the impacts of it. But it's not just me. No, <laughs> it's the complications are extremely difficult. Now, that is a question that it currently exists no matter what, whether no matter whether you have 15 council members or you have 25 or you have 50, that question actually currently exists as something that needs to be addressed, how you would implement it. Um, it uh, this historically happened once in 2001 and it was easily resolved because this also implicates the, the term limits section of the city charter. <laughs> um, when this occurred in 2001, there was one council member who was termed out and there was one who was not. And so that was a deciding factor in how that was resolved without creating any conflicts. Um, I think there's a really full discussion that needs to happen at some point on this. It implicates um, election methods. It implicates the, the um, the, the drawing process, the numbering of districts process. So, I mean, really to show you how that breaks your mind is when you have a district, you know, we have elections of all the odd districts in one year and two years later, all of the even districts. So if you're moving districts around and one of those districts is an odd number and one is an even number, now you've really complicated who goes where and what the impacts are to exactly your question of whether they will lose their seat and lose their ability to represent um, the, you know, will they have their full term um, based on what they um, were elected to serve, right? So it's extremely complicated and the more districts there are, the more likely these complications will be present. So it will be necessary to try and find some solutions to that question. Thank you. <laughs> All right, go right ahead. Okay, great. Um, the next slide is another decision point as it relates to these, consideration, these considerations that I just brought up. The first one is the consideration of whether or not we would like to, the committee would like to establish a minimum maximum limits for the city council. Um, for the options here, the minimum numbers we have on the back end are 11, 15, 17, or some other number. And the maximum numbers are 23, 25, and 27 districts, or some other number. 
the next point is um, a decision point related to when we would want to determine the effective date for the establishment of these new revised districts. Um, as mentioned earlier, we could either do elections in 2032 and thereafter, 2033 and thereafter, or 2034 and thereafter. And the last decision point for this would be um, determining a city entity that would be able to certify and establish the number of council districts following each decennial census. Um, here we have the options for the city data bureau and the city clerk's office, the city planning department, the bureau of engineering, or some other office or entity to be determined. Okay, so for Hold the next part. Sec. Hold on one sec. Yeah. Council Member in, in terms of decision points, I think there's, there's another one we might want to consider on all this, which is uh, whether or not we want to have some form of at-large seats. Um, I know one option would be to have, let's say, four regional seats, you know, you, in addition to the district-specific seats, and there's pros and cons of that as well, but I think that's another decision point. Um, I understand why in, in the past, in some ways, we've gone away from uh, at-large seats, and I think there's a lot of re good reasons to go away from them, but there may be some good reasons to do regional seats on top of the, the council. So that's just another decision point I think needs to be in that uh, decision tree about the total number. Um, we will uh, thank you for adding that to the list of um, issues. We will take a look at state law to see if there's any information on that point in particular. On the one hand, we always point that the charter provides the instruction on how we do it in the state can't tell us how to do that on the at-large. On the other hand, we know that the state has legislatively um, made a point that cities should be electing by district. And so we will, we will take that back. I think we need to look at state law in order to um, inform that discussion. Right. And is, is at-large the same as regional at-large? Uh, okay, we'll, yeah. we'll actually put that in. Okay, excellent. And of course, not to belabor it, since that's an issue that's coming up, but then that also does implicate some constitutional issues as well, depending upon how they vote, uh, because there's a one person, one vote issue that may come up, uh, as we had when counties were, uh, when state senators were elected by county rather than by district. So it gets complicated. All right, sorry, Mr. Yu, go right ahead. Okay, great. So um, the next slide we have, we're going to be talking about uh, potential challenges as it relates to this population growth methodology. Um, in the discussion we've just had, we brought up some potential issues, um, but just to m bring it up again, um, for most of the discussion that we've had as it relates to the population growth me methodology, we're talking about population growth, right? In the event that the population grows, the number of council districts would grow as well. However, a scenario that our office also thought of is whether or not, what would happen if we had large decreases in the, city, in the city's population. It's a very unlikely thing that would probably happen based on our history of historical growth, but based on recent news that we've had over the last year of people leaving the state, it could be a possibility and we wanted to include it as a potential scenario. Um, so some of the challenges are gonna be associated with a potential large population decrease and the issues that it might trigger are uh, the following. One would be uh, incumbents having to challenge each other for the same council office, depending on how the districts are, how the um, districts are redistricted. The second would be uh, difficulties with numbering council districts during the redistricting process, uh, as it relates, and this also ties into um, the next point of that, which are the inconsistent impacts that could have on even and odd council districts. You could have a numbering issue where there could be a scenario where an odd council district could potentially become an even council district or vice versa. And as, as, as a result of that, there are definitely election implications associated with that on when someone would run, right? The next point um, that's a challenge that we identified is the determination of council districts that are impacted by a reduction. How is the redistricting commission uh, going to, and what type of criteria are they going to use to determine a council district that would potentially get reduced and its potential effects on the communities and neighborhoods with it within those council districts as well. Now with all the challenges that I just brought up, we 
looked at potential remedies that we could help help resolve some of these issues. Um, one of the first remedies that we looked at was applying this reduction to council districts where incumbents are naturally termed out after serving full terms. If an incumbent is naturally termed out after serving full terms, that could be potentially a district that could be considered for reduction during the redistricting process by the Independent Redistricting Commission. However, issues would arise in this scenario if no council members are naturally termed out during a redistricting process. The next would be to present a ballot measure to ask the voters if they would like to reduce the number of council districts due to a population decrease. Following that, the next, the last remedy we identified would be to only include a condition with this population, population growth methodology that this methodology would only apply in the event of population growth and any accompanying increases to the size of the city council. So as it relates to those challenges and remedies that we just discussed, um, we also came up with several decision points. The first would be to, um, as discussed earlier, only apply that there, no be reduction, there shall be no reduction in the amount of council districts using, using this growth methodology. The second, as mentioned earlier, was bringing a ballot measure towards the voters to, for, to have them decide. And the third would be to only apply this reduction um, and it would be effective to the extent that sitting council members are naturally termed out of office or they choose not to run upon the effective date of the new council district boundaries. Not to get too uh, far along in making these decisions, but my thought would be that uh, whatever our policy is should have nothing to do with incumbent members and whether they're termed out or not. Um, it should be based on factors other than the interests of the incumbent members. So um, my own preference would probably be to ensure that we don't reduce the number of council seats, even if there is a decline in population, because that would simply mean that you know each person's vote is more influential with regard to their council member uh, if there's a reduction in population. So that, you know, that sh I think most people would see that as a good thing, not a, not a bad thing. Um, but if the people wanted to change it, they would always have the ability to go back to the charter for another amendment if it, if it really didn't make sense. But I can't see a scenario where a reduced population per district would be a bad thing. Great. So now we're gonna move on to a um, proposal that is relatively more straightforward. Um, and that this proposal is actually increasing the council by a specific number. Previous efforts, as mentioned earlier, to expand the size of the council included proposals that recommend a specific increase to the number of council districts. As can be seen in this chart that we have in this slide, as the size of the council increases, the share of the residents that are represented by each district would decrease. As a result of this decrease, um, going back to the slide where we compared with major US cities, these um, the increase in the number of council districts would bring us in closer parity to the ratios in other major US cities like New York City or the cities of Houston or Philadelphia. Um, and in our research, when we were looking at different legislative branches that were expanding the size of their councils or their um, Senate or legislatures, most of them chose a specific number um, because, again, no one has used the population growth methodology that we know that I mentioned earlier in my uh, presentation because there are a whole host of issues that need to be considered. So the next slide is related to this specific memory discussion um, that we just had and it would have us give the option, it would give them the option of whether or not would, the committee would like to retain the current number of council districts or we can increase it by a specific number and here we have 17 districts, 19 districts, or some other number of districts that you can also choose.
just to run that large indication through the Mr. Cat operation. I don't think that's a good thing for the council president. I mean, so it's not a good thing to give the council president more power. We should be going in the other direction. And so um, I guess it, I think it's a fair point about having a council that is so large that it becomes a, a you know, parliament. Uh, we're not supposed to be a parliament all the time. But that being said, um, the obvious initial point about the need to increase is that our districts are gargantuan. Uh, if, if any one of our districts was an independent city of its own, it would be the 16th largest city in the entire state of California. It would be the third biggest city in Los Angeles County after only Los Angeles and Long Beach. The second council district would be number three. The, sec or the third district or the, the ninth district or whichever would be the third biggest city in Los Angeles County. That, to me, that has become unwieldy and, and, and not sustainable. So um, in my view, retaining the current number should not be an option. Um, what the increased number is, um, I'm still a little agnostic on, but I agree with the mission to make sure that it shouldn't be as high as, as the number is. Ms. Nazarama, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, only that I, I don't have any based on things that I didn't get comment, which is, um, would it be necessarily true that the function of the council would change if the size of the council increased unless you made additional financial changes. So we right now have, um, as you said, an executive and a legislative role in our districts. Is it true that increasing the number of districts would necessarily result in a loss of executive power without additional financial changes? Legislative analyst herself, Sharon Self. Sharon.
in, a, in many other cities is the reserve of departments and of the mayor's authority. And so would that ch necessarily change or would we have to make other changes potentially to change that or is that much more of a informal with this conceptually because I say, okay, let's, the district I represent is huge. Let's divide it into two. Let's make it regional. Well, I think you put one more thing and take yourself off the table. So I just, so basically what that does is it sets up a fight for those sa the same resources we have now. It sets up a struggle, theoretically, between the mayor's office and these, uh, these two, maybe Council districts, because you, you, it doesn't actually give you more uh, resources. So I, I just, I'm trying to imagine how that ends up playing out. Uh, because in the example you just gave, if Raman asked about contracts, a lot of the contracts I have in my districts are because I don't have control of the department. So in addition to sanitation, we contract with people to pick up all the items that we need to pick up, and a whole bunch of other things. Member, we have complete. We can give direction to that group in a way that we can't give direction to the department. Um, and so that probably was predictable when we made the change from the department's requirement of having one person act as mayor. So, so now we, we just have that static set of services. Uh, and, I, and I just I, I can't really. I mean, you've been around, which is why I'm asking you. I can't get my head around.
do the work for our constituents. I shouldn't say force, that's not the right word. They, they, you, you have to go and, and compel through force of advocacy. I mean, we, we, we become the advocates for our constituents with city council. We can't order them. But we, you know, we have to go and be this, you know, be the squeaky wheel. And the, what influence we have is, you know, from the need of departments to come to council for policy agenda and for their budget. That's it. We have no ability to fire or hire or or criticize or anything else. So uh, maybe those are things that we might need to look at because in the same way the CAO reports jointly to the mayor and the council, maybe we do need to look at having department heads be more responsive when it comes to that. chair remembers very well <laughs> those same general managers coming back to us and bragging that they'd saved money and I told them I didn't want you to save money I wanted you to go spend it on services for the people not come back to me and say that you didn't perform the service and therefore it's a good thing that you save money so that's the degree of non-responsiveness even that we see right now and I just want to pause it as we're considering their I think when folks say they want representation, there are two kinds, right? So the one kind is, what's the distance between me and any given city service, right? So am I in line with 4 million people? Am I in line with 250,000 people? Or am I in line with 150,000 people? That's, so that's very direct and, and quantifiable. Then the other one is, how, can, how many people do I need or how big a... It, how much influence do I need to impact policy, right? So if I'm this neighborhood and we really care about this, but we're only one neighborhood in the country, Inglewood and Pasadena combined, or something less than that, how much closer are we to being able to influence the vote that happens on the floor of the Los Angeles City Council? So, I, and they're, they're really different things. Um, and this one is the one that I, I worry about the service question because it's the most quantifiable and I think it's the most widely and deeply felt. I, I also just wanted to ask the other members because we 
talk about departmental responsiveness with regards to the size of the body that's making requests to the department. But I also think about our relationship with the county and the county departments and whether they having a smaller number of supervisors has resulted in their departments being more responsive to individual supervisors' requests. And I don't have the experience to say whether they do or, or don't. Well, I, I think the, the big distinguishing factor there is that they have no executive. They literally do retain the executive power. So each one of the five of them is both the executive and the legislature. And yeah, they get, they get what they want. And they call a department. I think it's pretty clear they get exactly what they they want. Yeah, departments heads usually call the board of supervisors their bosses. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a lot of follow up questions that I think are not for this. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Hyde. Just a follow up, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, when we're talking about expansion, <clears throat> is that better? Okay, when we're talking about expansion, when we talk about services, does the charter leave room to expand uh, our employees? To expand our em number of employees? Number of employees, of right? Of the council? Of the council, absolutely. No, no, of the services. So we're looking at a population that is bigger than it was t 10 years ago, bigger than it was 20 years ago. But have we exponentially increased the, the staff to provide services? I, I think we do that as part of the annual budget process, which we're going through right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a function of the type of services um, that are required. We propose a very substantial budget for homelessness. You know, perhaps 50 years ago, it was not a major part of the budget. So I think we probably do that each year, annu you know, annually and we also make adjustments during the year through the financial status report. So we look at the budget as we adopt it, which is a budget plan for the whole year. And then we make adjustments for services um, based on what the need is at that moment. So I, I think the answer is yes, but then it's also a function too of the amount of revenue that's generated by the city, right? And so there needs to be a balance between the revenue that's generated and all of the services that are being provided. And so the mayor has an opportunity when, when, when the mayor presents the proposed budget, the mayor has the ability, the whole landscape available of all of the revenues and all of the services that are being requested and provided. Ultimately, that proposal will come back to you for review and consideration, amendment, and then approval. Thank you. Yes, Councilmember Park. Um, so, Councilmember Harris Dawson said something that really resonated with me, which was that you know adding more politicians to the horseshoe doesn't get us extra sanitation trucks in our communities and on the streets. And uh, Mr. Wickham, I think I warned you I was going to start asking some hard questions mm -hmm. on budget and uh, financial impacts of this, but. It, when we start talking about potential council expansion, expansion into 23, 25, 27, some other number, and we think about staff, salaries, benefits and pensions, city hall office space, field offices, all of the resources that we require to function as council offices. I, I'm wondering, do we have any sense? Because I think the I think voters need to know, and this needs to be part of their decision making. What is the budget impact potentially going to be, and what's what essential services are are we going to take out of the budget to accommodate putting more politicians at the at the horseshoe? So that is a very valid question, and I believe that one of the later slides actually talks about that because you will have some options as it relates to with an expansion on how you handle budgetary matters. For example, you know, do you, whatever the existing budget is today, do you put that all back into a pot and then divide it by 21? Well, then there would be very little impact, right? That's one option. But I, I can tell you right now that for 
an office like ours and some of the support departments mm -hmm. that if there is a, a, an expansion that it is very likely that some of the support departments may need additional support like the CLA will need to double uh, just for example yes <laughs> but but um, but the support CAO I mean and the city clerk more committees I mean there are uh, obviously going to be other costs that will be related to that but but um, there is a slide later that kind of addresses it and yes there is a potential uh, for uh, an increase in cost depending upon you know what decisions you make as it relates to the budget and how you staff whether more staff will be required by each member whether you shrink your staff so it there are a lot of considerations that will go into that thank you Sharon I, I hate to belabor this one point by throwing in additional issues but I, I just do want to also not leave this issue of numbers without also observing uh, that the number of, of districts uh, relates not only to the empowerment of individual voters but it also determines how empowered uh, institutional power brokers are as well and people who invest money in independent expenditure campaigns and so on and, and again just using say the a board of any board of super I don't mean to suggest the LA but any board of supervisors which has five members you know when you when you're looking at a district of a million people or two million people the idea of a grassroots neighborhood based campaign right. knocking off an incumbent is about as likely as me climbing no. Mount Everest no. it, it just is not no. ever right. ever going to happen and so the <laughs> thank you so I appreciate the confidence but but the so the only deciding factor in elections like that is where are the institutional players going to put their money uh, in order to pay for TV commercials and so on. Um, now, the, the larger the legislative body, the less important that is in each individual district, and the more likely it is that people who you know can avoid the impact of that, as as we've seen in this council, where we have five brand new council members right now, um, two of whom defeated incumbents, and, and so um, it, it's. I just want to put that out there uh, as a point uh, that I would argue in favor of a larger number of, of districts with with smaller number of people. Okay, sorry. Go. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Hernandez. Thank you, and thank you for bringing that up, Council President. Um, because something that was on my mind was that if we are to expand the the numbers, that it needs to be followed up by significant investment in public financing so that these folks have a shot. Because the only thing that gave me a shot was the the, pro, the matching funds program that Mike and others worked on. So I think it needs to be as robust as we move forward to make sure folks got a shot. One, one other issue I think that Mr. Harris Dawson touched on, and I don't know if this is something that you were trying to get at, but um, being one of 15 when you go to Sacramento or you go to Washington might mean something different if you're one of 25 or you're one of 50. So your influence outside of the city and your ability to bring resources to the city might be different based on your representation with the that's body. A, that's exactly what I was getting at. It, it's um, when you leave Los Angeles, among people who are decision makers over resources, it's widely recognized that you sit on the most powerful city council in the country. Right. And it's not close anywhere else. Yeah. And so the conversation's just different. Right. Which results in services, funding, and resources, resources and, yeah. for your district. Great. Um, the next uh, uh, slide that we're going to be touching upon is going to be looking at, as it relates to expansion, any um, potential external and internal impacts um, as it relates to boards and commissions. Um, one of the first uh, bodies that we realized would be severely impacted by a larger council would be um, the Southern California Association Government's Regional Council. 
Um, currently, every single council member right now is a voting district representative on the SCAG Regional Council. And just as um, a reminder of the public, or just to let uh, preface for the public, the SCAG Regional Council is a body that um, coordinates policy on a regional level, both in terms of housing, in terms of planning issues, in terms of our the, the most recently our regional housing needs assessment. Um, so as it relates to that, each council member right now is currently a member of the um, regional council. And if we were to change, if we were to expand the size of the council, we would also need to have discussions with SCAG as to whether or not they're willing to um, change their bylaws. Because right now, the maximum amount of uh, voting district representatives on the regional council is 70. The next one um, that we looked at was also um, the San Fernando Valley Council of Governments is one that has a proportional impact uh, a proportional amount of members based on the, that are in the valley relative to the board members that are currently on the cog. Um, right now, each council district that is that, uh, to be a member of this cog, each council district that is located either partially or entirely in the San Fernando Valley is a board representative. Um, these were uh, these two examples are the most um, the most recent examples that we could find in our research, but. Uh, um, I'm sure that there are other bodies externally that we are a part of that would be directly impacted by an expanded council. Uh, I just want to say this, this would truly be the tail wagging the dog uh, yeah. in that this, this will be the very last thing that I will yes. care about at I, all. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, the impacts are, are have tendrils everywhere. They, yeah, no, I mean, it's a good, it it's a good, it's a good example of how it has impacts everywhere, but in terms of importance is importance not high to our decisions, I, I can't see this factoring in at all. But it'll be significant to keep track of these things because things are going to have to be rewritten. The ad code is going to have to be rewritten. You know, there's some of this may actually be in the charter, not these particular examples, but there will be other things that we won't, that, that if we miss, there will be ambiguities and inconsistencies that are going to be very problematic. Yes, most definitely. And we just wanted to bring it up so that we could deal with, with all of it in one package instead of. Thank you. Yeah. So um, next would be uh, internal impacts, which are also similar to the external impacts. There are certain uh, internal city boards and commissions that would be directly impacted by an expanded council. One would be the City Health Commission, which currently each member has can appoint one member to the City Health Commission. Another one would be the City Council uh, Redistricting Commission in its current form. Each member currently um, appoints a commissioner to that body as well. Okay. Great. Um, and the next slide that we're going to be talking about is going to be related to the potential cost impacts as it relates to um, an expanded council. As we mentioned earlier in our discussion, there are going to be a range of costs that are going to be associated with an, the expansion of a city council, and they would vary very widely depending, uh, depending on several factors. One would be the amount of council members that uh, we choose to add to the city council. Two would be staff size for each council member. Um, with this point, uh, we could uh, the members, depending on the amount of funding they have, could have additional staff, or there could be implications in terms of redistrib redistribution of staff. The next would be office space, um, particularly office space in City Hall and in um, each council district's respective field offices, as well as office expenses. Um, we like to know that this would be probably be a very high cost, mainly with City Hall, because City Hall is a historic building and there are certain um, considerations that would need to be made as a result of expanding council offices in City Hall. Um, in addition to that, as it relates to City Hall, it would be City Council Chambers, as we mentioned earlier, both in terms of the cost of expanding um, the amount of seats that are currently on the floor, but also the um, actual practical limitations in terms of the physical space in and of itself should we expand the council. Furthermore, after that would be fleet costs. And um, moving on from that, the next potential impacts are the, the uh, so the next factor we should consider are discretionary funds that we have in each of the council offices right now. Each of these discretionary funds, um, as we can see in the budget, uh, each council office has discretionary funds in the general city purposes for council community projects. 
and most of these funds are used for to assist community and nonprofit organizations for constituent services, for contracts, as we mentioned earlier, for district services, um, or um, also district-specific trusts or special funds that might be particular or unique to each individual district. So as it relates to all these costs, um, a policy decision that could be made, policy and budgetary decision that could be made by the council would be um, whether or not we would like to, you would like to redistribute the existing allocation of funds that we currently have, or we could provide additional funds for the new members. Moving on from just the actual impacts of the council in of itself, as mentioned earlier by Sharon, um, we also have impacts related to um, operational departments that assist the council on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, so there's gonna be departments like building and safety in terms of plan check, same thing with planning, plan check. Um, any of the public works departments, filling potholes, street lights, sanitation trucks, issues like that. The city clerk's office for assisting the city council and its committees and the council in and of itself. The CLA's office, um, the CAO's office. I mean, the list could go on, but there is a very wide um, amount of uh, considerations that relates to departmental budgets that would be uh, impacted as a result to the larger city council. Okay, um, and moving on to our last slide, um, we're gonna, this slide will discuss uh, non-fiscal um, impacts as it relates to administration and operation. So one of the considerations we should have, as we mentioned earlier, would be like impacts to thresholds for passing council actions and participation in meetings. This would be related to um, quorum, uh, majority votes for council actions. There'd be a, th these thresholds would be carrying over to a, uh, an expanded council, but there'd be a higher number of votes that we needed to pass any of these items. Um, adoption of ordinances, um, and uh, in addition to that, as it relates to mayor mayoral vetoes. Currently in our current system, in order to override a mayoral veto, in most situations, uh, we would need two thirds of the members of the entire city council to override any mayoral veto in its current form. This could be a consideration that the committee and the council should have as it relates to um, conversations surrounding the balance of authority. So, um, and this could also potentially, depending on how the council is formatted and how it expands, could potentially hinder or slow the passing of legislation or policy, um, funds during the budget process, um, things like that. And w yes, and with that, um, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Liu, very much. Very comprehensive, thorough, thoughtful uh, presentation. Um, and judging by the number of questions it, it provoked, it won't be the last discussion on these topics. Um, but thank you for giving us a sense of the many issues that we'll need to address. Uh, members, any other uh, questions at, at this point for Mr. Liu or Mr. Wickham? Okay, uh, then we're prepared to go to our public comment portion of the meeting. Thank you uh, both very much. Uh, are there more cards in the, in the box? I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, I don't know if we need to move that computer off the table, but. Ah, thank you. Can you just tilt it? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so anybody else with cards? Uh, remember, my staff's going to pick them up, or you can put them in here There's in the box. Um, can, can somebody at least close that computer, if not move it off the table so we can call up two people at a time? Thank you, Phil. All right. Uh, so I'm going to call up two people at a time, uh, and we have, looks like about 25 or so uh, cards. Um, we typically take uh, one minute for public comment. I think if you need a little bit more time, I can be a little flexible on that, but. Um, but we do want to get through all the cards if we can. So I'm going to first call uh, Russia Chavez Cardenas, Lionel Morris. If you could come on up to the table, please. Good evening. 
Good evening, Council President and members. I'm Russia Chavez-Cardenas uh, with California Common Cause, standing on the principle that ultimate democratic authority is based directly on the will of the people and not the incumbent. We support an increase to the number of city council districts in Los Angeles to ensure a city council that is representative of all communities across LA and local political leaders that are close to and responsive to regular folks in our city. We recommend the number of council districts be adjusted every decade based on the decennial US census population results to achieve one district per 150,000 people rounded to the nearest odd whole population number. This will ensure that council seats represents roughly the average of what council seats represents in other large U.S. cities and ensures the size of the council will change automatically as the city changes. Further, we recommend the revised districts are effective in 2032 and elections thereafter and that a new city data bureau certifies census data. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do you have a letter in on those issues by any chance? And if you don't mind, if you, if you could make sure that we have that. Yeah, we'll put it on file tonight. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Myers, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lionel Myers, CD6. I'm here to speak in strong support of council expansion and ask the committee to consider a full range of options, including potential doubling the size of the city council um, and to ensure a fair and equitable representation for Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley. The committee needs to provide a remote public comment of, for all future committee meetings. And third, the committee needs to provide live video for all committee hearings. Um, thank you, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to call up Godfrey Plata, please, and Janice uh, Ramkalawa, what, Ramkalawan, I'm sorry. Good evening. Hey all, um, Godfrey Plata, he, him. I'm the deputy director at LA Forward and support civic engagement work with AAPI Equity Alliance. Both are part of the RLA coalition and LA Forward has also worked with Fair Rep LA. It's been noted that at 23 council members, we would just be getting on par with New York City. I hope that's the floor and not the ceiling. We heard your concerns today about what might change for council members if we increase size, but I urge you to remember what it feels like to be an unelected resident. We want representation that understands what our unique neighborhoods are like. The CLA report charts council size up to 25, but if we get closer to New York or Chicago with 50, Watts could have dedicated representation. Wilmington could have dedicated representation. Instead, both sit in the shadow of San Pedro. Koreatown, where I live, could have dedicated representation instead of having to compete for time with other communities of color like West Adams, which could have dedicated representation, or Crenshaw and Lamarck Park, which could have dedicated representation. I feel this as a community organizer. Too low of a size increase will keep us competing against each other to be seen. A, high, a higher size increase can further trust between residents and who represents them. Please consider sizes beyond um, what is charted in the CLA. Thank you very much. Good evening. Yes, good evening. My name is Janice Remkalawan, and I am a member of the Gramercy Block Club. And I'm, I'm here to ask a question. I've listened to all the proceedings, and I'm a little bit confused. But I see that it's a big job, and there's a lot to think about. And um, so I'll just, just say that from the perspective of the Block Club, we want to become more active. We want to participate in this process. We're a little, I'm a little late to the to party, yes, but uh, I'm still very interested. And we're not particularly convinced that a larger uh, group of uh, representatives would be the best for this city. I'm kind of with you. Let's see some more trash trucks on the, on the, <laughs> on the you know. Let's just let's you know do. Let's see the action that's going to come from this expansion. Rather, and also, I'm very concerned about the budget, which seems to be going everywhere except my district. So, I'm in <laughs> District 8, by the way, just just to let you know. Nothing against anybody else, but I'm just like, where's the fairness? He's where's the, the equity? He's the budget chair. By is the way. Is that, it's you. <laughs> no, oh. I've passed the baton. Okay, okay. <laughs> I do the same. I do the same. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's been a pleasure to be Thank here today you. and uh, to be enlightened by all your great questions. Thank you very much. So, Thank, thank you, you very for much. thank you for participating. And I just like to be in touch, and I kind of like to know 
where I can go online, and I, I think Angel is our representative. Mr. Harris Dawson staff will make sure that, that um, you are uh, invited to all of our future Thank hearings you so much. and that you'll have access to the full report that the CLA has been reporting I appreciate on. That. That's true of everybody else, too. If, if you want to see the full 125 page long report, oh, written report. No, I'm serious. I, I, don't be intimidated by that. It's really oh, no, great no. if you care about this issue. <laughs> This is the treatise on, on this issue, I know and, that. and I it's know available that. to you online. I just don't know how to direct you to, to get to it, but one of our staff members here in the, in the chambers will be able to do that. Uh, Jessica Panduro, followed by Susana uh, uh, Coracero. Mm -hmm. I hope I got that right. Good evening. Hey, good evening, folks. My name is Jessica Panduro. I'm a representative with Inner City Struggle, and we're also a member of Our LA. So Our LA is a coalition of community-based organizations working to ensure that the voices, concerns, and residents, particularly low-income BIPOC communities impacted by racist systems in the city of LA, inform the governance reforms process. So changing and thinking about resizing city council, this has a profound impact and political power in the city of Los Angeles, especially to marginalized communities. So the thing that I'm asking here today, as we continue to move forward, as we continue to engage community, as and we continue to engage this conversation, I'm really happy to see a big room today but is to involve and collaborate with community-based organizations, schools and religious institutions so that they may support outreach to historically marginalized communities, inform residents of these upcoming listening session and ensure that they are committed, to, that the committee is dedicated to an equity governance reform process. And we've seen it in city council. Right now there's a lot of mistrust knowing that there's a racist city council member still se being seated. Thank you. So right. just Thank you. take into account community. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Buenas noches. Um, first of all, I just want to welcome you all to South LA. You guys look great being here, and you guys should come out more often. <laughs> um, <laughs> My name is Susana Coracero. Um, I'm a representative. I work for um, CD Tech. We're a social justice and economic justice organization in South LA um, and director of organizing. And we're also a member of RLA. Um, while we appreciate the listening sessions, we also want to share concerns about the engagement process. Um, we have a full room today, uh, but we know that has not been the case. Um, and we want to make sure that we foster high levels of community involvement um, during this process, being that this is something that's very impactful to political power in the city of LA. Um, we want to make sure that we restore and cultivate trust with residents and local government by informing, affirming, and empowering residents in every council to share their perspective and recommendations. And we want to make sure that, there's n that the only way to do that is to be in, in person um, sessions like like these. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, next, I'd like to call Jeremy Payne and Mike Feinstein, please. Good evening. Uh, good evening. My name is Jeremy Payne. I am a representative of Catalyst California. Uh, we are also a member of RLA. You heard from a few members of our coalition. I just want to read out some of the other organizations that make up our coalition and community-based orgs. We have AAPI Equity Alliance, Alliance for a Better, Cal uh, Better Community, California Black Power Network, California Native Vote Project, Catalyst California, CD Tech, Community Coalition, Inner City Struggle, LA Community Action Network, LA Voice, and LA Forward. And for the last few months, RLA has been working to engage low-income BIPOC residents through in-person convenings and surveys on this topic of governance reform here in the city of Los Angeles. Um, changing the makeup of uh, changing the makeup and the size of our council districts will have a profound impact on the political power in the city of Los Angeles, 
and thus we strongly urge you to root your decision making towards a goal of improving representation, especially for historically marginalized communities and Angelinos, rather than striving for a specific number or a specific number of residents per uh, in the district. Um, and we hope that you kind of consider and ask yourself as you make your decisions on council district size that will your actions increase the odds of council members engaging with our communities and foster a better understanding of the stakes for the communities they represent. And in the interest of time, I will end there, but thank you committee members for your time and consideration on this topic. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you a question, Jeremy. Do you have any upcoming convenings that you wanted to announce or uh, have you concluded the cycle? Uh, we have concluded our first cycle, but we will be hosting a uh, new summer sessions of convenings for residents across the city of Los Angeles uh, to participate in and to make their voices and concerns heard. And, and we will want to have uh, the accumulated information that you've gathered from those convening convenings presented to the, to the committee when, yes, when you're absolutely. ready to do so. It is in our interest to um, put together and evaluate and formulate that into a uh, a means of sharing that with the council so you are able to hear directly from your constituents. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Mike Feinstein, former Santa Monica mayor and city council member representing the County Green Party. We believe you should be studying a council along the size of New York or Chicago, elected by proportional representation from multi-seat districts of three to five members. We think right now your sites are set too low and you're gonna to fail to meet the problems you had with recent redistricting. An independent redistricting commission by itself doesn't get at the root of the problem because it's not just that politicians are picking their districts, but it's that you're having, at, as you acknowledged at your last meeting, you're picking winners and losers. In a multi-seat district with proportional representation, you can, you can pick winners, winners, and winners. The diversity within a district can all get elected. Um, Portland just went ahead and voted that in um, mm -hmm. to go with multi-seat districts and you should be studying their model. In a city as diverse as Los Angeles, single-seat districts are not capable of representing the full diversity in each district. And I sent you a letter along these lines and would love to meet with your individual offices to explain how proportional representation would work. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I it, it did. I don't think there's a name on this, but uh, someone from the Baldwin Hills Homeowners Association? Sorry. That's okay. It's President Rorells. Uh, and also Candace Cho, please. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Shirley Worrells, and I'm here in support of expanding. If we're in 2023 and we're dealing with a population that started in 1924, it's a no-brainer that we need to do something but we're going to trust you, at least I'm going to trust you, I trust my council person to make the right decision for us. One of the things that I heard today against it was because it, it causes a lack of efficiency. That is your accountability to manage efficiency. I just wanna remind you of that. And the last thing was redistricting. We learned the hard way that we need an independent body for that. And so the current process does not engender trust. So we need to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Candace Cho, Managing Director of Policy and Council at AAPI Equity Alliance and a resident of CD10. We're a coalition of over 40 community-based organizations who serve and represent the one and a half million AAPIs in LA County. We're also a co-founding partner of the National Coalition Stop AAPI Hate and a member of the Our LA Coalition who you've met today. AAPI Equity is deeply invested in these conversations around reforming the city. We are raising awareness among our member organizations and among AAPI residents across the city through virtual teach-ins and in-person convenings, by email and on social media. And while we appreciate these listening sessions, really more needs to be done to ensure that the process for engaging residents is inclusive, equitable, and truly representative of the city's diversity. We need a transparent process that provides for more public outreach and education, more timely notice before hearings, live transmission of hearings, multilingual engagement, and multimodal accessibility, not just in person. AAPIs care about this issue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I'd like to call next Huang Nguyen uh, and Pete White, please. Good evening, council members. My name is Huang Nguyen. I'm with AAPI Equity Alliance, part of RLA. As we proceed with these citywide conversations about council size, we need to pay special attention to neighborhoods that have been historically sidelined in conversations about political power, like Koreatown, Chinatown, Little Tokyo, Historic Filipino Town, Thai Town, and Little Bangladesh. These are also neighborhoods whose names, uh, there are also neighborhoods whose names don't always underline the density of API populations within them, such as Pan Par Panorama City, Eagle Rock, and Sautel. Uh, this entire process can no longer be hidden behind closed doors. We've seen how that went. Engaging communities across LA not only lead to the proposal being most representative, but will also build trust. There is a survey for residents to fill out to voice their opinions on this issue. The website is tinyurl.com slash our LA survey. We have over 700 res uh, respondents already, but are looking for more. It is open until next Friday. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Pete White, uh, South Central Native, uh, organizer with the LA Community Action Network. Um, Los Angeles is in great need of representation that works for residents and not simply for deep, do deep pocket developers, campaign contributors, or those special interests that currently wield an unfair advantage over the direction of our city. That said, any expansion proposal must highlight the potential harm to politically at-risk communities like the black community and offers remedies to cure that disenfranchisement. If inclusion is your stated goal, don't allow exclusion to become the heir apparent outcome. If you are serious about including residents and exploring ways to expand council districts and seats to foster a more representative city government, you must start by deep engagement of the black community whose political assist existence was conspired against by council member Cedillo Martinez de Leon and labor leader Herrera. You must give ample notice when holding public meetings and ensuring it's at a location and time of day that benefits the public. 4 p.m. is not in any way an optimal optimal time for participation. You must accept written comment anywhere meetings are held. And you must commit to the hard work of going deep and not surface level engagement that fosters more suspicion if you are genuinely interested in cultivating trust, representation, and, and expanding voice in Los Angeles. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to next call Valerie uh, Morishige and Rob Kwan, please. Good evening. Hello, my name is Valerie Morishige and I'm a resident of CD4. And I volunteer with over 30 voter registration and civic engagement organizations. So I talk to a lot of voters and especially young voters. And what they all tell me is that the system is crooked and it's corrupt and they don't wanna vote. So what I'm asking is that everyone knows the default position is no on initiatives. That's just how people think about new things. They wanna say no. So I need you all to engage the public. They need to see that this is a transparent process, that you're being very inclusive about who you're inviting to the table, that everyone's invited. And that, you know, I had, um, there's some college students that are helping out with this um, website that we're working on. And they all wanted to come here and give public comment and they can't because they're in class and you don't have anything available via Zoom. And uh, the CLA report is like buried somewhere. So we need a website. We need so much more public engagement that it's really embarrassing that this is all we're getting. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, Rob Kwan, I, and I'd like to begin by addressing the idea of lowering the threshold for council overriding a veto with a simple majority. I, I think that would be viewed by the public as a bit of a power grab. The point here is to slightly lower the power of our council. Um, I agree with the concerns about tying our district's uh, sizes to population. I think it complicates designing a redistricting plan and we'd be better off establishing an independent periodic charter review process to make tailored charges, changes to our charter instead of adding unnecessary and unpredict, unnecessary unpredictability to the measure. Uh, I think it'll also be a bit confusing for voters to get their heads around. I'd also like to uplift the comments about Portland. They recently expanded their council to 12. 
They have three members elected from four districts each. Um, I, I think that the, the idea that we should be setting our sights down to the low 20s is a little ridiculous. Uh, we need to give voter, voters something real. They need to see real results quickly. And I, I think that if you look at Watts, 17, 19, 21, that doesn't solve our problem down in Watts, where they're landlocked and they're stuck in a district where they are underrepresented. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kathy uh, Guyfon and Gwendolyn Wood, please. That's a T. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I guess I should have guessed that. Sorry. <laughs> Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you, um, city council members. I am Kathy Guy, and I am a member of the Empowerment Congress West Neighborhood Council. And we wrote in community impact statements for both of these uh, council files, but I'll just read you what we put for uh, redistricting. Los Angeles needs to develop an independent redistricting process. Our current process is flawed because it allows council members to draw their own council district lines which allows them to pick their own voters, which allows them to protect themselves. That's pretty much solves that. As far as the... Um, Wait, I'm sorry, was that, your, was that the community impact statement? That was one sentence, you can see that. I, so you so now your rest. individual comment, let's add another minute then, please. You can read the rest um, Thank you. In, in the council file. As far as uh, council members, uh, as you mentioned earlier, we haven't changed in 100 years. By simple math, we should have 45 or more. I'm not saying that we should increase it that much, but we, right now, you are as big as some cities. Fremont, Spokane, Washington, Buffalo, New York. It's ridiculous. There is no way that you can represent all those people. And so we have to do something about the number. And um, I'm not too concerned about our power outside of Los Angeles. I'm concerned about the power and the representation of our folks that in my neighborhood, in my neighborhood council, feeling like they have a voice in, in the city because right now they don't. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Hi, my name is Gwen Wood and I'm from CD8. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm looking at, I don't know if uh, you guys realize when you guys when we make changes like voting on a measure everything's not filled out like you don't have regulations in place how you're going to uh, enforce it none of these things are done so to me right now it looks like you need to change the charter first before we come online saying oh we need this many people to represent us because this charter apparently is only making you guys like a travel agent because I call a travel agent and she's looking at the same screen I am on 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 the computer you're telling me like I can ask Marquise right now I need something picked up and he's gonna say well call it in he's calling in we're not neither one of us is getting the answer I'm paying you to do a job and you really need to be able to do it. And right now, the charter seems to be hurting you. And you're not being able to do your job that we're paying you for. So somebody needs to be getting, looking at that because that in itself, if you get 21, 45 people, if you don't have control of your city department heads, you have nothing. So right now, your charter is your biggest problem. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm gonna call uh, Maria Isabel Rutledge and uh, Kristen Nimmers, please. Good evening. My name is Maria Isabel Rutledge. I'm part of the Community Coalition, IDF Plus Block Club and uh, CPAB and uh, I, several other organizations. But uh, I'm a community member that's uh, been working with, uh, with the services here for over 20 years. And uh, I just feel like this um, flawed redistricting in 2020 was just 
something that came up from what's been happening way back when. And now we know that this happened. Why is it that this isn't being reversed? Why isn't it being revisited? Before we start looking at, at how you're gonna do things in the, in, the, in the future, let's fix what we know is wrong, that was wrong. Because everybody, all of the districts need to have proper uh, uh, financial capacity, you know? And if you're gonna be stealing you know, capacity, you know, resources from, you know, just because the way that they did it, uh, or they have been doing it, then I think that that needs to be fixed before anything else. Thank you. And also, I wanted to say that, um, that at this point that I understand, I don't know if, it, if it's right, but you guys raise your own uh, salaries whenever you want, however you want. <laughs> That's what I was told, and I said, Just for well, the record, that, the is, that is not the case. It's not the case. We have, it, it, it is not at all the case. Our, our, our salaries are tied to whatever the state sets judges' salaries at. Okay, so. okay. So I am appreciative that you come to, these, to the community because when I go to the city council, often, too often, I don't know if with this new uh, uh, set of council members is going to be different, but I feel totally unheard. It would take a lot of time and effort to go to the council office downtown and everybody's fiddling with papers on their phone, giggling, drinking this, walking around, and we don't feel heard. It, it is really not right. Totally disrespectful. And we'd like to see something different. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Um, all right. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, uh, council members. My name is Kristen Nimmers. Um, I am a representative of the California Black Power Network. We are a coalition of over 37 black-led and black-serving organizations across the state, including LA, um, and we are also a member of the RLA Coalition. Um, so for the last few months, as folks have mentioned, we've been doing outreach with RLA to engage low-income BIPOC residents um, and communities of color, particularly black folks within our base who are often not intentionally included or involved in these sorts of processes. Um, as other folks in our coalition have lifted, expanding city council will have a significant impact on the political power and the representation of our communities in the city of Los Angeles. We urge you to root your decision making in improving representation, especially for historically marginalized and underrepresented communities, um, rather than striving for a specific number of districts or residents in a district. We also urge you to think about whether your process um, and your actions will increase engagement with our communities and foster better understanding of this process and what's at stake. Um, to foster more community involvement and input during this process. We recommend that you provide the, pu the public with more notice about these meetings, that there are other ways for them to participate beyond in-person sessions, and um, that you're intentionally working to cultivate trust with the community and do outreach to particularly underrepresented communities. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, are there more cards? Are there, are there any other cards? I have two more here, um, but I have two more here, uh, so I'd like to call Tawana Caldwell and the Honorable Kevin Murray. Good evening. Um, my name is Tawana Caldwell, and I'm here just representing um, the residents of the city of Los Angeles. And uh, the question that I have is how would, um, I don't have no, nothing to say, I think it's how would redistricting affect historical landmarks and financial institutions that support the council district? Good question. It is one of the questions that we have to grapple with because as, I mean, we're, we're not really supposed to get into too much of a dialogue, but just a simple uh, uh, brief answer to that is, as you know, this was one of the things that people were fighting over in the last redistricting. And it happens every redistricting because uh, especially when you have so much diversity of opportunity, even in a single big council district, there are some places that are much wealthier than others, some places that have assets that produce a lot of revenues that are able to be used for that district. Um, and so those become those become one of the objectives of redistricting instead of the people in the district. And um, so that is, a, that is a big challenge. And it's especially a challenge, at, at bigger, it's maybe even a bigger challenge as districts get smaller because then whatever district happens to have that one big asset 
may be disproportionately benefited. And, and honestly, that's a that's an issue that none of us have an answer to until we really boil down to a solution that mitigates for that very problem. It, it, and I would I would just offer I agree with everything that the uh, Council President Kokorian says, and I would just add this to that: it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, it's by a choice. We can we can distribute resources based on need. We don't have to do it by geography. It's just the way we've been set up, and uh, this is a. Now that the light has been shined on it, I think it's an opportunity to figure out something different. Okay. Senator Murray, good evening. Hi, I, I had only intended to come here and observe, but I was now compelled to, to, to say something. My name is Kevin Murray. I'm the president and CEO of the Weingart Center. Uh, we build homeless housing. I would emphasize 100% uh, homeless housing. Um, Previously, I spent 12 years in the legislature representing this area of South Los Angeles, uh, including a stint as chairman of the Senate Election Re and Reapportionment Committee. Uh, and I've been in and out of the room, so I apologize if, it's been, if this has been said, and maybe it's been said in other words, but I haven't heard the two words community of interest. Uh, when you're doing redistricting, the base legal standard is communities of interest. And so as we talk about what the number of seats should be, uh, it should be the number for which we believe that all communities of interest can be represented, and that's both ethnic and ge geographic and regard to assets and, and, and needs in the district. So I think an, another analysis needs to be done of what are the communities of interest and how are they represented such that everyone is represented. So I wouldn't get bogged down in the New York model or the Cincinnati model or some other model, I would get bogged down in what this, this city needs with its particular residents now. Uh, I also don't think this is something that should wait till 2032 or 2033. I'm sure there are lots of people that disagree with that. Uh, and I know that that probably makes it easier relating to the census, but all of you, I, I, I have happened to have contact with all of you, and you all understand that justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, back to the practical matter, I build affordable housing, and I'm, am I, are you, are you about to stop me, which you can? I, I have given a little latitude on the clock. I, um, I, appre I appreciate that. I'll be, I'll be very brief. Uh, as an affordable housing developer, um, it, th this actually slides both ways. So in one sense, a larger district means that the council person is influenced by different legitimate constituencies in a larger ge geography. So when I'm going and, and proposing, particularly me, affordable housing, where I've got to go in and convince the community that this is something they want, having to deal with a broader, uh, a larger number of interests who may not be you know, across the street from this project, but may be miles away, but have a philosophical opposition to it uh, sometimes becomes problematic. This also cuts the other way in that if you have, you know, right now, you, uh, you mostly need eight votes to, to get approval for a project. And if I had to go and get 20 votes or 25 votes, I think that would make it difficult to develop affordable housing because you've just got to move around and get more people uh, uh, to support you. So those things go both ways, but I again would like to push you to go back to the core of, uh, uh, of what redistricting really is, which is making sure that communities of interest have an opportunity to elect the person of their choice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, I have two more cards, and if anybody else would uh, like to offer comment, please just go ahead and grab one of these and um, hand it in to uh, any of the folks who are in suits. <laughs> I don't know if, or, or uniforms, I guess that works. Um, so the last two cards that I, you have, have more? Oh, it's, okay, thank you. Um, Asada Umoya and Kimlin Johnson. Good evening. Hi. Okay. Hello, Good evening. To the commission. 
Um, my, my name is again Asata Umoja. I'm with the Hyde Park Organizational Partnership for Empowerment. That is a uh, uh, community that is in um, South, uh, South Central LA. It is like at least 60% black right now. And we're very concerned about making sure that we have representation in, in our community. We don't want to be um, um, unfairly uh, divided and broke up. We've already lost uh, some primary um, things that are very, concern very much concerned to us because no community can survive without an economic base. That's clear. Absolutely, you, if you don't have an economic base, you don't have the basic tool that you need for survival. And back when they did the last redistricting, two major institutions were removed from our district. And we need to have those uh, uh, institutions replaced. We need to have them returned to our district. In addition to the fact that with the, uh, the, uh, the, the mess that happened, I'll say, with the manipulation, you know, um, that uh, really kind of like created a situation where we were in a more vulnerable position in terms of not being able to regain those assets, I think that the commission really needs to look at that, make sure that communities that already are dealing with uh, economically uh, depressed issues have what they need in order to survive, have the tax base mm -hmm. that they need in order to survive, have the economic institutions and the tools that they need in order to survive. And so I think it's critically important, you know, that we look at that. The other thing is I am for reducing the size of council districts. I think they're too large. I think a lot of times people's needs don't get met simply because we don't have uh, the type of uh, representation that we want. And some of that is due to just not being able to um, reach all of the people that are there. In addition to the fact it breaks down, I think, the demographics so that people that are concentrated in more in one part of an area have an opportunity to have representation. So those are my concerns, my primary concerns. The most important one has to do with making sure that the economic tools that are needed or the engines that are needed in a community, and particularly in our community, in the 8th District, we need to have those tools, those uh, institutions returned. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, my name is Kimlin Johnson, and I'm currently on the City of LA's ballot for the Southeast LA Repair Zone for solving math anxiety in middle and high school students. And um, tonight I came actually to ask um, for representation for something that was just started on Say So Chavez Day. I started something called the Black Math Collective. It's a group of STEM professionals that are going to handle the issue with math for underserved students, the black students first, and they can roll it out however they want, but it's a group of dynamic people. So I came here today to ask um, CD8, which is my representative, Marquise harris Dawson, if he can send a representative. Our, next, our first meeting was March 31st of this year. Our next meeting is Cinco de Mayo. Um, that is no accident. So, um, and we are here for everybody, but that is going to shift um, things for our students and our future. So, Great. thank, thank you. you very much. I'm, uh, I uh, finished a few credits short of a math degree in college, so I'm gonna send somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe this could help. It's never too late to go back. It's never too late to finish. Um, Larry Matora. And are there any other cards? Otherwise, this is this will be our, our last speaker. Good evening. So I'm going to try and wing it. Um, I, I basically came because I'm I was more frustrated with two things: the infrastructure in my neighborhood, as well as the groceries that have moved out of my neighborhood. And most of it, I've pretty much blamed my council member, Marcus Dawson, but. Uh, Thanks today, you were able to kind of align with what we're thinking. The issues that I have is access to uh, the legislation as well as uh, to, sorry, to the policies and services, which you mentioned earlier. So thank you for that. And I think listening to everybody asking you to expand the council is because we want to have access to that. We have uh, local um, councils that we meet neighborhood councils mm -hmm. and from what you mentioned if you lost your executive power maybe you can start pushing to get back that uh, executive power and such 
sharing the legislative power with some of these uh, local councils. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Any other speakers who wish to, to be heard? Okay. Very good. Members, um, any other comments that anybody would like to make or any other questions? Councilman Baraman. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to all of the speakers who spoke today. And I will say that I'm really impressed with the commitment in this room to expanding the size of the council and even beyond some of the numbers that were suggested in the report. I will say that looking at the history of the expand, council expansion in the past, there was a ballot measure during the last charter reform effort that tried to expand the size of the council. There were two different numbers suggested at that time, 21 and 25, I believe. And both of those efforts to expand the size of the council failed. And when I spoke to somebody who was involved in the redistricting and the charter reform process last time, they mentioned that they had separated out council expansion from the rest of the charter reform ballot because council expansion was so unpopular because people didn't want more politicians in Los Angeles. And there was real resistance to that. And so I think, I hope that the voices here are representative of a broader sense that we need more representation and more representatives in order to really serve this city. But I would also say that I think we collectively, all of us in this room who feel strongly about this, really need to step up and do that outreach to make the case for this to the public because it will involve a greater investment in council offices. It will involve a larger budgetary allocation towards staff if we want it to be done right because the hope is that if you expand the council, you get better services and that doesn't happen unless you put more staff members towards each council office, right? And so it will require that effort from all of us to make that case if this is really what, what this, this body and the people in this room really believe and want. So I want to thank you all for being out here today, and I'm really excited. Very well said. Thank you. Councilmember Harris Toss. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you to everyone who uh, came out uh, today and uh, offered testimony, offered perspective, uh, and offered thoughtfulness. I think, um, it, you know, there's this sort of prevailing narrative that you know, this is insider baseball, only nerds care about this, and the wider public doesn't. We had a full uh, room today, and they even blocked off the Martin Luther King entrance into Expo Park, and we still filled up. And, and folks offer good content, so I, I, I want to be um, uh, express a lot of gratitude for that, because I think it's meaningful. I, I, my takeaway from th this meeting, uh, I remember that the, the 1999 redistricting, also, on the same ballot or a ballot near there, there was the expansion of the County Board of Supervisors for much the same reason. That also failed uh, in dramatic fashion. So um, uh, um, hopefully this time around we, we have a better, better narrative. And I uh, appreciate uh, that you all have put to us in very clear terms, uh, all of you, I could start naming names, but this is what you all, uh, all the comments I, had, I heard had in common. And that was, we elected you, you figure it out <laughs> and take the risk and lead. Come up with an opinion, take a position and bring it to the voters and see what the voters have to say. And so I take that charge very, very seriously as I think all my colleagues do. Thank you. Council Member Hernandez. Thank you, Council President. Uh, what I'm leaving with today and something that I heard multiple times is uh, equity. And you know, I think you know, the city has talked about it. I've heard, you know, Mr. Wickman talk about it in some of his presentations. Um, so there's synergy there, but I think we could do a better job of making sure that it's at the front instead of an afterthought, especially in whatever direction that we go because things are not equitable now. And so I just, um, I'm excited to hear that that is also resonating with the community and really grateful for you all and also our city staff who are here holding it down too. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Councilmember Hutt. Sure. Uh, gratitude again. Uh, this is what civic engagement is about, right? The opinions of the community, sharing with people that can make change. I'm so happy to be in this partnership with everyone. I took notes for every comment because I think it's important when we are really making decisions that it is a global thought. 
So I just want to thank you all. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for uh, the team that brought us together in this community. I'm from South LA, hello. So I'm not a visitor. And it feels really good to be here with uh, neighbors that have an opinion and are here to engage. So thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember Blumenfield. Thank you. Uh, echo the, the, the gratitude. I, I really thought this was a thoughtful discussion and I appreciated all the comments uh, from everyone. Um, it, it fits into sort of how I was framing it at the beginning to some extent. I mean, in terms of the real need for more representation, I hear that loud and clear. Uh, I think especially, and we didn't say it as explicitly, but as demographics are changing, you know, particularly the African American community, we want to make sure that that there are, are seats that are able to be represented by African American uh, elected <coughs> officials. Uh, and we know that the numbers are such that that is diminishing. And the way that you can keep those voices is by having some additional seats. And that's true with a lot of other uh, groups. But it's also true about that balance as you go, as you go bigger, what are the downsides? And, and, and Senator Murray, when you were talking about affordable housing, it made me think of you know, the struggles I've had in my district where uh, I've, I've been very aggressive in putting in affordable housing or you know, interim housing to the consternation of the local folks who were there. So much so that people protested my house for six months twice a week who lived in a particular area. And I can tell you, if I just represented that one area, um, either A, I wouldn't have had the fortitude to do it, or B, I wouldn't have won my election my reelection. Uh, so I know that if the districts are, are really small, to some extent, it's going to be difficult to make those hard choices, like the choices that I've made. Uh, and I know that when you do something like that, and you put the affordable, the interim housing in, um, you get a lot of pushback for right away, and probably an election cycle. Over time, you overcome that. And I know, and I've been working, but it takes years. Um, and, you know, the particular pockets that I know, uh, I suffered from popularity, but I, it was important to get that done, uh, would have been difficult uh, given uh, a smaller, you know, more narrow interest district. But those, again, is the, the push and pull uh, where we need more representation. There's, there's positives to that and there's negatives and, you know, somewhere in the balance lies the answer. There's no right answer, but an answer that we, should, we need to come up with. Uh, and I, I think that was reflected in the comments that we heard from all of you today. And I have to say, I've, I've been in the council for 13 years. Um, I've sat through a lot of committee meetings. I don't know that in that 13 years I've ever sat in one that was as substantive as this and as um, where the public was as deeply engaged in the substance of what we talked about as I just heard. Um, it, there's a lot of hearings where we have where people are really passionate about things. and. Um, but, but today what I heard was really everybody digging in to the complexity and challenge and difficulty and importance of this one issue that we're moving forward with on, on charter reform. And so I'm, I'm, I'm tremendously, as you heard from all of my colleagues, grateful to all of you because we, you know, we might have, and you're right, Mr. Aristotle, and ultimately we have to decide something and we put it on the ballot. Um, and, and we will do that eventually. Um, but I very much believe that I can have an idea, might be a good idea, might be a bad idea. I don't know until I hear the feedback on it. And what all of you are giving us by participating today is your really thoughtful and nuanced feedback on the many proposals that are before us. And that makes our work more effective. And it makes us as your elected representatives more reflective of what you want us to do. And that's what hearings like this are supposed to be about. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. But I just want to put a, uh, an exclamation point on what Councilmember Rahman said. Uh, because this engagement is very important in what we ultimately decide to do and put on the ballot. And I'm not going to politic now, but your continuing engagement after we put things on the ballot is at least as important. Because whatever we decide, I can guarantee one thing, not all of you are gonna love it. 
uh, you know, somebody is going to find something in here in, in there that says, well, you know, it's better than what they had, but I think they should have done it different. That's true. That's the nature of the beast. There's, it's not going to be perfect as much as we try it to be, but we are sailing into headwinds on this. And, and I heard a pretty wide consensus of, uh, today about, well, we don't know whether it should be 17 or 51, but it should be more than 15. I think that was you know, a, a widespread consensus. Whatever we end up putting on the ballot, I would just urge you to be as involved then as you were tonight and bring your neighbors into the discussion, bring your communications channels into the discussion. If you're part of an organization, if you're part of a labor union within your church or in any other way that you can help to bring more people into this cause, it will help this get over the finish line in a way that it hasn't in the past. And that's, that's where we hand the ball to you really and say, okay, you know, you gotta, gotta get it passed. So, um, I look forward to us putting a good product that you can all be proud of uh, on the ballot so that you're, you're all able to do that. Um, with that, again, thank you all very much for being here this evening. I do want to take a moment also to, to thank uh, the, IT, the ITA staff who make this possible to, to be here. Uh, thank you to the CLA, to the clerk, to the city attorney. Uh, to all of these members um, who uh, extended a long day even longer to be here um, and to our respective staffs, uh, I very much appreciate all of you being a part of this important hearing. So uh, thank you all very much. With that, uh, this meeting is, do we adjourn or recess? I guess we adjourn. It's a, yes, yeah, so we are adjourned. Thank you.